All right, everybody, welcome to the Sunday live stream. Uh, we got a lot of things to go over, a lot of things to go over, so let's just jump right in. The first thing is uh, we've got a special guest today. Uh, my buddy Jerry V. Hall is back in action. Jerry, welcome to the show for the uh, 20,000th time. Thanks for stopping by. <laughs> Good to be here, Rob. Thanks, man. Yeah, and of course, you guys can uh, find Jerry's information. There's a link in the description for his Twitter account. He used to do a lot of YouTube videos, kind of stepped away. I guess he's doing uh, too much over there in, in Costa Rica. Once in a great while. I just recently did a, a, a with a CEO an interview with Akash Networks, the uh, the blockchain cloud com computation network. Nice. Pretty interesting stuff, yeah. Cool. I'll link that in the description as well. So Thanks. today, Jerry, what we're going to talk about, first we're going to talk about because the whole thing is this, as everybody, as everything heats up, especially in the altcoin market, the discussion becomes how risky should I get into this? Because you'll see somebody like myself and like Jerry as well, who are like, you know what, Bitcoin's doing pretty good. We're going to stick with that DCA. But then as things start to heat up, you start to see, hear a little bit more of, I'm not going to say degenerate type of thing. I'm going to say more risky type of plays as things come in, because it's my personal opinion that the biggest risk that you can take is not investing whatsoever. Now, on this show, me and Jerry can't give you financial advice whatsoever. And tomorrow we could see a drop of 30 to 50 percent. Nobody knows. Does anybody know, Jerry? Does anybody know? Nobody, Nobody knows. So that's just we're just going to take a we're just going to take a little walk down memory lane, see where we are and just see how risky it is. And we're going to talk about some of our risky, quote unquote, degenerate plays. And we'll go from there. So first things first, the market. Sunday. Is it, Jerry, is it just me that feel like Sundays are kind of like those, those like kind of like mini dump days? Well, I definitely believe that anytime you start seeing gains that outpace or outsize the traditional markets, yeah. they're going to be a segment of that network, those people, that population that are, that are here to trade. And yeah. if you can make 15% in three days, take the money. I mean, if that, if that's your game and there are a lot of people playing that game. There's a lot of people and that's okay. I mean, look, you got to take profit. That's one of the rules, right? Take the profit. Don't trust anybody. Everything's scammed up otherwise. Don't invest more than you can afford to lose. Don't use leverage or type of stuff. But it just seems like uh, Saturday, Saturdays sometimes and Sundays, it's like the markets are closed. We're, what's open 24 seven besides Forex? Nah, crypto. crypto. So we get stuff like this. But before I move on and, and talk about the risky plays, let's talk about some of the safe plays and why things are really going well. Me and so me and Jerry were talking behind the scenes before we came on, and he said a couple of couple of things. Jerry, there was three reasons that you talked about about why leading up into this this next year it's going to be massive. And one, I had no idea what you were talking about. So just talk about the first two, and then we'll talk about Fastby. Okay. So the the first one was this once in a lifetime event in Bitcoin's life, right? The Bitcoin ETF represents one, if it's a spot ETF, which is what we're all right. hoping these, these applications that are in process will get uh, approved for, requires a one-to-one -one ratio. In other words, they have to have the same amount of Bitcoin in the fund to represent every share of the fund that they've sold from a dollar dollar basis. So if they sell $10 worth of the fund, they have to have $10 worth of Bitcoin in the fund. This is huge. Because it, re no. it takes demand. It, it puts a demand pressure on a market that is already picking up steam in the speculative world, right? The guys like you and me. What? Yeah, that's true. So, yeah. And as when Jerry gets unfrozen, just as a, as a real quick thing. And remember, Jerry's in Costa Rica. The, the Wi-Fi is not fantastic over there. But as a reminder, like when the, when the gold. Sorry is, about that. That's going to happen. It's okay. Uh, when, when the gold ETF came about, remember, there was like, it was pretty much flat for quite a long time, but there was like no down years for like the first eight years. And then we had like a little bit of a, a drop in the in the Great Recession time. And of course, gold uh, hit its all time high not too long ago. So if this ETF goes through, that's great. Fantastic. It's going to be a big run. So that was the first thing, the once in a lifetime. Second thing, Jerry. Well, the second once in a lifetime is this, is this, um, ruling that came from a regulatory body that regulates and sets the guidelines for all corporation reporting what they call the FASB guidelines for okay. gap accounting the financial accounting standards board mm -hmm. this year 2023 you the board unanimously passed that they will change the designation from bit of bitcoin on a corporate balance sheet from 
an indefinite intangible, meaning that whatever, whenever you buy Bitcoin, whatever the lowest price it ever traded for while you've owned it is what you have to mark its value at in your reporting, which is really hostile yeah. to owning Bitcoin because it's fluck. You know, you can go from 30 grand to 60 grand to 15 grand in the course of 18 months. We've seen it just recently do that. Right. And now it's back up to 45. So when you change the designation from indefinite and tangible to fair value accounting, which unanimously was passed this year, then whenever you report your holdings in your K9 reporting, that you can mark the Bitcoin at the price of that day. I don't get it. So, you Jerry, don't, don't get it? No, no. Just I explain, explain it even easier, simpler. Because when we first talked, I'm like, I don't get it. And it doesn't make, and I don't really think it was a big deal. And, and then you told me why it was a big deal. Well, it's a, it's a big deal because if you bought Bitcoin and it's trading at $45,000 today and you're right. doing your reporting today, right. wouldn't it be nice if you had one Bitcoin on your balance sheet to be able to show that you have $45,000 in, in assets? Well, that's answer, Yes, of course you would want that. That's how it's supposed <clears throat> to be, right? That's how it was but supposed it, to be, and, but it's not. But when it's indefinite, intangible, you have to have that price of that Bitcoin valued at whatever the lowest price it was since you've owned it. So let's say yeah. I owned it when it was at 15 grand. Right. That's what I have to value that Bitcoin at. For the whole, like, and that's like for the hostile. whole time? That's a hostile treatment. Yeah. Yeah. You'll, it'll never go up. That's dumb. It'll always be the low. It's, it is dumb and it's not <laughs> intuitive, but it is the way it's been. The point is that for a long time, since MicroStrategy led the way, yeah. other corporations have been resistant to get into Bitcoin because of this one fact, the FASB accounting rules for Bitcoin. But now that the board has changed that and they will start to roll out their new guidelines in 2024, mm -hmm. now we could see this once in a lifetime event, the doors open for corporations to take Bitcoin on their balance sheet. This is big because again, it puts extra demand on an already static market. There'll never be more than X amount of Bitcoin produced by the miners each day, Yeah. period. And that having obviously affects that supply, right? Right. Then there's the last thing, or do you want to save that for less? Okay. Yeah, yeah so I, I just want to go through this one, one, one more time to make sure everybody's got it. Because this is, this is when, when Jerry told me this, I'm like, I, I'm like, who cares? But then of course, Jerry had to, had to explain to me because I'm a simpleton. So let's say, so like you're a corporation, you're like, I want to get into Bitcoin. I'm like, okay, but let's say like they they tell you the the bad news, which is MicroStrategy. MicroStrategy put Bitcoin on the balance sheet at 67,000, right? Or at the very top. But during that year, it was actually the lowest it went to was like 32,000. The time of which it was the lowest that you got it at is what it will always be. So when we're talking to our shareholders and we're telling, hey, we got this Bitcoin, I mean, even though it's worth a million dollars today, we got to report, <laughs> report at 32,000. And that's why they're like, eh, maybe not. So I can understand that. So, okay, right. we had we had the ETF, the FASB ruling, which I now it makes sense and we get more corporations in. And the third thing is, is what El Salvador is sing singling, a uh, signal, signaling to the world. Yeah. You, you put up an animation on Twitter which was like a little two minute animation thing of why El Salvador is not selling its Bitcoin. But in that little infomercial that they did, they actually go over some really good points. And that is what the Bitcoin is meant from an, uh, a currency in the economy standpoint and what Bitcoin is meant as a treasury asset for the, for the country. Right. These are huge, huge uh, forward driving uh, cases being made. So we've got sovereign entry cases being made, corporate entry cases being made, and an entire segment of the investing public that did not want to open a Coinbase account and learn how to do private keys, but would have no problem whatsoever telling their Schwab brokerage, hey, go ahead and load me up on some of this Bitcoin ETF. Right. Makes sense. So three big, three big things. And that I'll go with the fourth thing, which isn't a lot once in a lifetime, but you know, there's a having coming out and it's only like four months away. Think about that. January, February, March. Yeah. Four months, 
four months away. So Jerry, excellent explanation about what's happening. And the reason why we, we brought this to everybody's attention because everything kind of flows through Bitcoin. Bitcoin pumps up first, then we go into some, uh, some large caps and the mid caps and the micro caps into the, into the uh, low cap gems, as, everybody likes to type, as the kids like to say. So when we're doing all these things and I'm looking at it and people are saying, you know, we should take some profits, which we should. Along the way, you should really take some profits and we can talk about when. But I was thinking to myself, I'm like, is this a good time to really start thinking about taking some massive profits and maybe not getting into some of these smaller caps? And potentially it is. But I will say this. If we take a look at some on-chain metrics. I pulled this from looking at Bitcoin.com. Again, link in the description. Addresses with a balance of more than one Bitcoin, you can see, is roughly at an all-time high. So people who have been accumulating, the people like us who front ran everybody, essentially, because we knew what time it was, uh, we're really heavy and we're not going to sell. And then also we take a look at Bitcoin addresses with, with a balance of uh, greater than 0 0.1. Again, all-time high. Addresses with a balance uh, <laughs> greater than 0 0.01, all-time high. And we can go over some other things, but let's just go into MVRVZ. So if we think about like, like selling and stuff like that, is this a time to like really let go of Bitcoin? Some people can make the case it is. I got to tell you, if you look at the, the market value versus the realized value and the Z-score kind of takes everything out, look at how far away we are. And historically, it's been pretty damn good, quite honestly. It depends on what you want to do. Now, every, every indicator has its faults. That's why you got to use a bunch of them just to kind of get a sense of what's going on. But just with the MVRV score, eh, not really. Then we take a look at the Puel multiple, which is, again, taking a look at uh, miners and how much actual uh, profitability they have. Puel multiple hasn't even reached up into even half. And we take a look at the Pi cycle top. That's where we take the 350-day moving average times two and cross over the 111-day moving average. We can see that we are far away. And over time, if we take a look at the, at the Pi cycle top, it's nailed it in 2013, 17, and it did a pretty decent job in 2021, around 59,000. Ah, Jerry, your blood pressure. And then lastly, the NUPL, which will, which will give you pause if you think about it, because the NUPL, profits and losses, it actually has crept up into the disbelief or belief in denial stage. So maybe if people are thinking about it, if, if you group all these things together, maybe like, uh, maybe I take some profits, maybe not. But that's up to you. And everybody's journey is their own. Jerry, before we go on, what do you think about all that gibberish I just talked about? Ah, uh, thanks. Jerry's got a train that comes by every so often just to check on him. And that, that was that was the noise you just heard. That was actually the church. Sorry oh, the about church. that, everybody. Sorry, the church. Yeah. <laughs> and there it goes. One more time. So I, I'll tell you what, everything you just said is so spot on. But the one thing that I am, and maybe I've got my once in a lifetime bias hat on here. Sure. I, because of the scarcity of Bitcoin, we've, we've never had an asset in the world ever that had such a finite scarcity to it. So here's my thinking. My thinking is these once in a lifetime events with the, with the um, signaling of, of, of sovereign nations, the corporations getting the doors kicked open in 2024 and the, and the ETF reaching the public in yeah. a huge way. I don't want to like I, I've got huge profit in Bitcoin this year. I was buying in January. I was buying in February. I was, you know. Oh, I hear you. Poor Jerry and the Costa Rica Internet. I apologize. This it's will okay. be gone on the 11th. My Starlink arrives, by the way. But anyway, that's a look at you, baller. Day. Getting the Starlink. Very nice. So the the back to back to I don't want to. I don't want to sell my Bitcoin and make twenty thousand nah. dollars. You know, which is the profit I made this year from a Bitcoin. Why would I want to do that when there is potentially one hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of profit in that very same Bitcoin with that very same amount of investable income? Right. It's all. It it's, make, it just, uh, because there'll never be another once in a lifetime event. That's why they call it a once in a lifetime event. This is one of those things about time horizons. And it's all about your risk tolerance. So some people like, like I got, as I get older, I get less risky. I'm just like, eh, I just want to take some profits and move it along the way. But some people as they, as they, it doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter. I, I've got people on this channel who reach out to me in their, in their late eighties 
I got some people who are in their like late teens, early 20s. It doesn't really matter because everybody is different. So whatever you want to do works for me. Of course, everybody's journey has to be uh, their own. So I can I can definitely see that. Me personally, like I take a little bit of profits here and there just so I can remember what the heck it feels like to take some profits. Because when I, I'm telling you, I think the problem moving forward, it's not so much about the buying. We can all do that. I know we're all pros at buying dips and DCAing and stuff like that. The problem is actually getting to sell. So, but there is a case right now to get a little risky. And what I wanted to take a look at, what Jerry talked about, you know, these these events that are happening. We're rolling into the Bitcoin halving. Happens every four years without fail. It doesn't matter if there's a, a pandemic. doesn't matter if there's a world war. It doesn't matter if, I don't know if an EMP would do it, but it doesn't really matter. It's always going to happen within four years. And we are going into 2024. And the, the previous year before that, it kind of like, it doesn't match perfectly, but I'll tell you like in 2015, you see how like at the very end of the year, there was a big run up, a little bit of a drop, run up again, a little drop, and then off to the races. And then of course, over here in 2019, we had a, a run up, a little bit of a drop, run off again, drop, run off, a little bit of drop because of uh, the, the uh, corona sickness, and then off the races. And I think it's gonna happen again. And I think right now we might have a little bit of a drop. That's why I think like, okay, let's say we have like 23% drop. If we do great, I got to tell you, I feel like I am buying uh, some some assets that I think are a little bit uh, a little overvalued right now. So I could take I could take the discount. That would be great. But then some people will say, Rob, what about the M2 money supply? Because that's really what what drives it, which I have to agree. If we take like the M2 money supply and over not this, let's overlay it with the uh, crypto market. To a market cap. Yeah, we can see that, of course, it just went up. Then as the money supply retracted a little bit down, but if we even zoom in a little bit further, we can see that even though that the money supply went up, the crypto market still went down a little bit. So I'm not I'm not saying that this goes lockstep with everything with the money supply. And right now there is a retraction. There's quantitative tightening right now. I think the money printers will turn on next year. But when they do, I think it'll be pretty, do pretty well. So even though we're around, you know, in the cycles like around here. We could still have a nice little run up. We could still have a drop down. But I think I'm trying to make the case here that I think that as time goes on, this might be a chance to get into a little bit risky assets, as opposed to saying like in 2022, you know, YOLOing all the way in and then having a drop 90%. And now, Jerry, does that make sense? Or like, well, it makes a lot of sense, especially when I've lived both lives, right? So uh, October 2021, I was buying up Metaverse. Yeah, projects, projects while we were at the, the you know, uh, sixty five thousand dollar Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You know what I mean? And and uh, um, using Ethereum to do it, you know, Ethereum was what, forty five hundred dollars at the yeah. at the time. And yeah, yeah, yeah. and and all of those projects, a lot of them were in the Ethereum world and have subsequently just been hammered into the ground. All of us know who own Gala. And, oh, yeah. And, you know, uh, Block and sand and you oh, know, yeah, I, 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 I. yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's pretty bad. It's been hammered. But I like I said, like I think since we're kind of going into the direction that we want to go to, I'm not saying there's like a 1,000 X out there and everything I'm going to talk about today will do that. I'm just saying that I think we're closer to the more bullish nature than we are to the more bearish nature as we move away from the 2022 and we kiss 2023 goodbye. But then you got to think to yourself like. Well, how far away are we? And there's this website that I steal from liberally. And it's Ben's website into the cryptoverse. And I want to show you something. There's been a nice little run up with Bitcoin, right? And I told you everything goes through Bitcoin first. Then we go into like some large cap alts, then some medium cap, and then some low cap or gems. There's this thing called the risk levels. And right now, the risk level for Bitcoin is actually quite high. I didn't realize it was this high, 0.6. And that means we're at 43,000. And before we get into this, risk levels just means essentially like this. The time that each crypto spends on these risk levels or the price levels that it actually is at, it varies from crypto to crypto, but this is Bitcoin essentially. So like as you move up in these, these levels, you start to see higher, higher prices, right? And it's only been 18, for like the 0 0.9 to 1.0, it's only been 18 days. And that's when you had like the prices of around 59,000. 
or in 2017, uh, 19,200, or in 2013, 978, or whatever else it was. So for me, like when I'm doing these, you know, doing these things by by uh, the risk levels, I just look at it, I'm like, okay, I've got this, and let's say that it's uh, the price starts to go down. That means that the risk level goes, <laughs> the risk level uh, goes down. Price goes down, risk level goes down. Less risk, right? So maybe I spend 50 bucks here in the 0.7 a day or a week. Then it goes to 0.6. I put a little more. Then 0.5, a little more. And you get where I'm going from, right? So I will buy more as it goes down and I'll buy less as it goes up. And I start to think about selling around 0.75, 0.8. Hopefully it makes sense. So we're looking at Bitcoin. We're at 0.6. And before I show you all these alts and what risk level they're at, let me get some input from Jerry. Well, you know, there's so following a theme of DCA yeah. was always bright. And I remember even guys like you and I, I mean, I remember we talked about this when we first met and stuff. Yeah. The the how how to DCA and that gauge that you just talked about is a great guideline. Doesn't have to be followed to the letter, no, but it is definitely a good guideline because one of the things as we continue to mature in this market the circumstances and situations in the market will slightly change right mm -hmm. and then as more money flows in that just changes the dynamic of the market altogether right? right so the corporations that start coming in countries blah 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 it'll change but that guide is perfect especially when now we can apply it to other immature markets like the alts bitcoin is growing up it really is. It's almost yeah. a trillion by itself. I mean, it's getting there and it will be 10 trillion in our lifetime. It'll probably be 20, 30 trillion in our lifetime. I like that. Pretty I like fair to say. I like those numbers, Jerry. That's why I got you well, on my show. It just, the, look, Bitcoin is not going to die. Everything else is subject to change. Yeah. Like, I don't know which layer one is going to be the one that the, the next uh, YouTube app that everybody uses is going to be on. I don't know. I don't know either. So that's why I many of them just like you so let's let's take let's continue this let's get into some yeah. of the results i'm curious i own a bunch hey J jerry i'll ask you a question before we get into it now i'll ask you later and here, here's the question question is how many how many alts do you own i'll tell you how much i own in a little bit i'm not not the not the the the, the numeric value but the actual numbers of alts so alt and alt is defined by any coin other than bitcoin other than bitcoin oh my goodness exactly so hold on hey, hang on with that thought so guys so we're looking at Bitcoin. The level's pretty high, 0 0.6. Now, as we go down again, as far as like the risk levels, Ethereum's actually higher, 0 0.646. It's actually done pretty well. And I would like to say this, and when it gets to 1.0, it's at 7,500. Now, these numbers are in flux at all times because as we move and more data comes in, Bitcoin itself at 1.0 is 97,895. If it hits that, I'm out. You won't see me again. Let's take a look at Cardano though. Cardano, 0 0.427, so not near as high. What about Polkadot? Polkadot, it's a pretty good project, 0 0.157. Avalanche, which is crushing it in the gaming sector. I can't believe it's this low, 0 0.167. And if we're looking at, holy smokes, we're looking at one, it's $464. Let's go to Chainlink, 0 0.551. I can see that at 16 bucks. At 1.0, $132. And again, these aren't price predictions, but you can see where we're going. Uh, Solana, which had amazing run-up, is only 0 0.527. It's, it's at 73 bucks a day? I'll be damned. 1.0, 683 bucks. And let's see, Polygon, 0 0.181. BNB, 0.24. VeChain, 0 0.17. Algorand, this is the worst, 0 0.087. And at one, it's $6.90. Let's see, what? Maker, 0 0.24. Uh, Ripple, 0 0.17. Cosmos, 0. So you see where I'm going with this. I, I think right now that this is a, a reasonable time to really get into a little bit more of risky plays. And these are just like, you know, the top 50, essentially. Now, as we start going down, which we're going to get into in a second, um, it could get uh, pretty profitable, but extremely risky. Jerry, input. I, you know, here's my personal strategy. All right. I've made bets. I've been in the game, what? five years or so and there are bets that i've made that are still on the table yeah. right i made a bet on xrp it's sitting there i'm not <laughs> it ain't going nowhere it, it, i'll do something with it when it's time to 
do something with it. Uh, I made a bet on VeChain. Uh, yeah. It's sitting there. It's staking, right? I'm I'm earning VeChain plus its its Thor token. It just sits there and marinates. I got a bunch of these layer one protocols that are p- proof of stake that I can stake, let it auto compound, and I I've made the bet. I've placed the bet once. I'm walking away. I no longer DCA into the project. And that's the majority of the 100 plus tokens I own are in that category. I made a bet. They're sitting there. I, I have a portfolio on Live Coin Watch that has everything identified. And, and that's the deal. Now, I have maybe six projects that I'm active in. In other words, I do buy and sell these things. I do acquire them. I do something with them. Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano. I love ADA. Just love ADA. Yeah. Singularity Net, yeah. and of course HyperCycle. Uh, of yeah. course HyperCycle. Yeah. Oh, of course. So <laughs> yeah, of course. So Rich Tran says, "Here's a strategy. Bitcoin will lift all boats." I gotta agree. And true story. It depends on your like, and and we'll get into this in, like risk tolerance. But uh, it really depends on what you want to do. Like, uh, I got a, my friend Ben over in the cryptoverse. Uh, I know some people like, they say, ah, they should have went into alt heavier or whatever else. But I, Ben had made a pretty good point to me. We were talking afterwards. Actually, he was talking on the show. And he was saying, he's like, you know, he goes, it's just less risk. He goes, I don't want to deal with, with, with the headache and the problems and everything else. And I think there's a, there's a majority, not a majority, a lot of people out there just like, you know what? This is safer than, say, the S&P. This is not safer. This is the asymmetrical bet. As, as opposed to like the indices or some kind of T-bills or treasuries or whatever else. And I think I can do like a two or three X here. If you're say Mark Cuban, right? And you put, I don't know, say like 40% of your net worth into Bitcoin. How much you think, I mean, into crypto, how much you think he'd put into Bitcoin as opposed to say tomato coin or as opposed to say whatever? I think it'd be the majority. I think the more that you have, the less risk you want to take on. You're like, why do I take so much risk? If I two x, if I two x forty billion dollars, I'm doing okay. So it's everybody's tolerance and going from there. So, anyhow, Jerry, what do you think? Well, and also I think that everybody has to kind of have a view of where they think the world is going. Right? Yeah, I'm of the opinion that um, the Internet of Things is rolling out. I believe you will have a refrigerator that'll order your food from the grocery and also pay for it. To a household wallet that it's connected to. I believe that. I believe that we're going to have um, AI doing things for us that, that oh, yeah. well, we're only in Star Wars movies, you know, 15, 20 years ago. I believe robotics are going to take a much larger place. So when I'm investing and I go, hmm, okay, I can put $100 into NVIDIA, which is an AI play, yeah, or I can put $100 into HyperCycle, which is an AI play, which... You know, if hyper obviously NVIDIA is a much solider risk free asset relative to hypercycle. True. True. I get that. I get that. So, so maybe I'm going to devote $500 this year to AI. I'll put 150 to NVIDIA because that is like the Bitcoin of chips. Yeah. And, right. And it did great. And then, and then I come down and I go, okay, well, the next layer of risk is maybe I'm going to back that up with a little bit of AMD. Again, back in the stock market, maybe mm-hmm. I do a hundred dollars there. So half of my five hundred dollar investment is in, in blue chip. I know those are those are pretty solid. Yeah, but yeah. I'm only going to maybe make ten or fifteen, twenty percent a year on those. Then I come down with the rest of my investment and go, hmm, hypercycle, good, good white paper, great team, great project, has potential. I'll put one hundred and fifty dollars into that. Now it has a potential of going a thousand x because it's you know it's nothing now it's nothing and it's risky and it's risky but you know i'll take on but again like all these projects that i've had in the past i'm not afraid to put some money into something that could be something later if it gives me a couple thousand x it's not a big deal but i don't put all my money in it no it's true and you know what like like we we talk about this as far as like like with dogecoin if you were to put 10 bucks a day in dogecoin in 2019 for like six months You'd have outperformed everything. That's Dogecoin for Pete's sake. That's why I like Bonk. So to, exactly. to move on with, with, with that exact same theme, here's what we got. So as far as like, we made the case for why Bitcoin's gonna do well. 
And of course, it was made very clear that uh, that is one of the the parts that will ra that will raise all boats, right? Bitcoin's going to do pretty well, especially with that FASB ruling, especially with things that are going out of Salvador and so on and so forth. So we move into like, and we just took a look at some of those major caps, uh, Ethereum going down. Now, as we move forward, what about the risky stuff, Rob? It's a great question. And again, could we go down 30%? Yes, tomorrow. Sure, why not? But does that mean that we can lose everything? We lose everything? No, I think we're going in the right direction. So I'm going to be on uh, Cardano with Paul's show. Uh, this was uh, this will be to, tomorrow. I think it's tomorrow. Is today Sunday? I think it's tomorrow or Tuesday. And we're going to talk uh, Cardano and things like that. We're going to talk about my recent buy, which was uh, Snake or Snake. I don't even know how to say it. But this is a meme coin, right? And it's for funsies. It's not like it's not like Snake is going to change the world and it's going to become the world reserve currency, and everybody's going to go into it. No, this is straight up gambling, essentially what it is. But I mean, look at this one. It's done pretty well. Could I lose everything? Yeah, probably. Or yeah, maybe. Who knows? And then of course my favorite, Bonk. But today, of course, Bonk I feel is like the Solana Dogecoin. Today, Bonk's down ten percent. It was actually down much more. I think it was down like twenty percent today. Uh, yeah, and of course it goes up. Very risky plays, but again, it's not like I'm putting everything into it. Uh, Tencent, another one that we got into a launch pad. I'm doing a, a, um, a quick video on Dan Dgen channel because I think it's a it's a great as far as like a launch pad and the things that are coming out are pretty great. Also, as far as a launch pad, they have a money back after like seven or 10 days if you don't think that it pumped enough, which is crazy to me, but all right. Uh, Pith or Pyth Network. Again, it's the uh, it's the Oracle of Solana, just along with Chainlink. And we took a look at Chainlink. I think that's even a, a, as well as a good play, but I mean, the risk value is kind of going up. Pith is, I think is just starting. We talk about Immutable X. And of course, I've had a, a lot of the guys on from, from the Web3 gaming space. Uh, Jesus Martinez had Kagi, had uh, Stash, and had uh, uh, Johnny from Banteron. And uh, this is one they talked about three months ago. I got into it, did pretty well. Alluvium, not too bad. It's done 30 days, 13%. I wish I would've gotten in a little bit earlier, but uh, hey, what are you gonna do? And then lastly, Playable, which that was from Jesus Martinez, 30 days, 252%. Again, take some profits along the way. And then lastly, Hypercycle. And then, you know what, Jerry? As, start talking about Hypercycle and tell us what it is again. And let me take a look at the at the play as far as like the amount. Because Hypercycle is an AI. To me, it's kind of like, I think of it like like computers talking together or working together to create better AI. Okay, so the premise the premise here is that like um, how oil was the driver of industry over the last yeah. 120 years, right? Yeah, that we believe computation computation will be the driver of of uh, great innovation going forward. Right, hypercycle is a network for AI to contract with other AI for computational purposes. Right. And so there are many different ways to participate in the hypercycle um, <laughs> ecosystem. You can, um, you can uh, have a full, a full node setup where you have the actual hardware, software, and the tokens for the economy of the network, yeah. where all you have to do is plug in a AI module right from an open source AI marketplace. Let's say you want to do medical research and you're doing something on the on the benefits of the vitamin C compound on the mitochondria. And you've got 800 million thousand gigabytes of data to crunch through. Have that AI do it. Use the computational resources on the network. The smart contracts within the saddle servers can facilitate not only the work to be done, but the payment of the work done upon completion. And it's basically AI working with AI in an AI network open to the world, as opposed yeah. to siloed within AWS, Google, or Microsoft. I think that's huge because like, I know that, so we have ChatGPT, we have Bard on Google, and then also X just rolled out uh, Grok which right. I've been using, which is a pretty fun, fun way to do it. But I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, there's got to be a limit because you can, only, you can only do so much. There's only so many different uh, uh, computers and chips that you can actually do before you say, you know, we need to open something up. To really, I, I kind of look at it like almost like Theta. 
like Theta is like, there's only so much storage that we can do for, for video services. So we're gonna use the unused potential for, the, for our users and we're gonna pay them in Theta token. So like hypercycle. Well, right now, when you use any of those AIs mm -hmm. that you just mentioned, um, yes. do you know you're contributing to them, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, Are they're, you getting they're paid for all that? my data. I am not Are getting you, paid for that, Jerry. Oh, you're not you're not getting paid. Oh, I'm not who, getting paid for that. Who benefits financially from that? That would be there's this guy named Elon Musk. And there's or the whoever, Elon, right? Or, open, and the open Elon AI, Google and Microsoft. Uh, Google. Yes. Uh, okay. So the point is, the point is hmm. that companies like Singularity Net, which is our one of the the, the mother companies of, of or, you know, where the origin of hypercycle came from, this whole family of AI that lives on Ethereum and Cardano. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so having it be in the world, in the realm of, I can participate in this network. I can have a business on this network. I like this network, not to mention what it opens up to AI developers who can create modules in an open source marketplace. And now all of a sudden you've got this robust economy going on behind the scenes. It's really an, an yeah. impressive thing. And you know what's I awesome. wanna let your viewers know, we're yeah. gonna do a token giveaway today. This is impromptu, but I've got 160 tokens that I wanna give your audience, which would mean eight people. All they need to do is go to at Jerry V Hall one on Twitter, connect with me, right? Uh, what are they, friend request or whatever they call it there? Follow, follow yeah. me. And I what will get doing? with you in a private, I will get with you in a private message, get your um, Ethereum MetaMask deposit address and I will send you tokens. Damn, that's nice. So everybody, I put yeah. that in the chats. I put that in the description. And of course you can see it right there at Jerry V Hall one. And I think that's, uh, let me make sure that's right. Jerry V Hall one, yeah. Without the X, it's on X. So I'm on X. Jerry, thanks for giving away free tokens. People like free, especially it's almost time for Christmas. So, well, the hope is that if they get a couple of tokens, they'll take a peek at the project. And that's all I ask. I don't ask anybody to make a determination about it, but I've done, I've been in this game long enough that when I looked into it, I went, this is real. And, and it, I got so engaged in the process that I reached out to become part of the team in some way, shape or form. Yeah, and you've been a lot, you've been, I know that you were telling me about when we first met a lot of low cappers and that worked out pretty well. So we'll see if this one's the next, well, look, your next golden lightest touch, Jerry. Where's yeah. the world going? Is, the, is AI gonna increase, yes or no? Is robotics gonna increase, yes or no? And then yeah. we look at decentralized areas in the crypto space that meet those verticals and, and like try to evaluate, does this got something to it? Right. I don't know. I This looks really good. And we will be rolling out a main net within the next 12, well, within the next nine months, I believe is the time. I, I'm not clear on the exact date we're supposed to have the main net, but we're getting, we're inching closer and closer and closer to a main net where developers will have AI. Yeah. There'll be a network to do the computation. Yeah. And there are already private companies coming to hypercycle for the computation of the AI. They want to use the, the resources Man, because this they is... don't want to pay Amazon. They don't want to pay yeah. Microsoft. They don't want to pay Google's prices. I got that. That makes sense. So guys, this one is, um, it's risky. Like everything we just talked about is super risky, but this one's risky, risky, but it's early. So we'll see how it goes out. So Jerry, yeah, good stuff. Thanks. Thanks, man. All right, so everybody, that will conclude the day for, for uh, me and Jerry jabbering on. So if you gotta go, take off, go watch the football. Go watch the football. Go watch the games, and then we'll talk soon. <laughs>